Hello. I'm here to give you an idea of where we can possibly go with a distance education. Um, I'm what's called a permanent member of distance education since my retirement last year. So um, let's get on. Uh, I'm thinking it's necessary to give an introduction, to give context to the points that are going to be discussed today. I'd like to give uh, some historical perspectives, two different perspectives in terms of distance education. I'd like to discuss where we are now and discuss also where we should be going. And finally, get into a debate concerning some of the controversial topics that we're going to be discussing today. In terms of the introduction, um, the, the title of this presentation comes from a work by uh, Vladimir Lenin. Uh, Lenin was a Marxist, as you know, and he believed in the construction of a workers' state. And uh, he was concerned back in 1902 that he wasn't seeing that construction of a worker state. He wasn't seeing uh, the, the destruction of capitalism. He saw workers struggling, but he didn't get to see what was his dream, which was that socialist state. And so what he did was basically uh, reorganize, rethink, and he saw it was necessary to construct a revolutionary organization, a vanguard organization, to lead the workers towards that construction of a socialist state and for the destruction of capitalism in, in his country. And uh, I think well, there are... Uh, some ideas that we can gather from this concerning uh, distance education. He had a dream, we have a dream. We have a dream in, in distance education of seeing a, a really good methodology that is really optimum in terms of learning for students. But for us to, to reach that dream, we also need to look at our history, where we've been, and to reorganize ourselves so that we can reach that dream. Which means we should look at distance education from a historical perspective. And if I look at technology and distance education in Puerto Rico, I can see that um, in the 1930s, when the radio came out as a technology in society, um, it had a great impact. And also what we saw in the decade of the 1950s, how television came out and had an impact on our society. And how in the decade of the 90s, uh, the internet was developed and it had an impact on society. Curiously, as one of these landmark technologies developed, an educational use of these uh, technologies was also immediately implemented. For example, when radio came out in Puerto Rico in the 1930s, uh, and the, the Escuela del Aire, the, the School of the Airs uh, was created. Uh, when television came out in the decade of the 1950s, uh, immediately a television station was developed under the, the Department of Education of the time. Uh, to be involved in uh, educating students. And in the decade of the 90s, uh, we saw how the University of Puerto Rico immediately connected with the academic networks to be able to establish internet. And once the internet was established uh, in the universities, we began to see the rise of platforms such as WebCT and Course Info back in the 1990s. So what we see is, is that when you have some landmark technologies, immediately educators find a use for them. In my case, when, when I finished my degree in Albany State and I come to Puerto Rico, uh, the, the distance education that I was seeing was from Channel 40. And the professional organization that was uh, really pushing this uh, was ACTE, which belonged to the Association of Educational Communications and Technology. 
So Channel 40 was already, when I come to Puerto Rico, already practicing distance education. This was under the Anna G. Mendes University, and it was an extension program um, using television for, uh, as part of its program. Uh, curiously, in 1985, 10 years after my work with, uh, with educational technology, uh, I get a visit from the University of the Virgin Islands, and they invite us to participate with them in the introduction of the internet uh, for distance education. And it was because the Macintosh uh, came out recently, and along with the Macintosh was a program called HyperCard. So what we saw is that immediately we were looking for a alternative type of distance education using the internet. In the in in 1990, I participate in the International Council of Distance Education's uh, World Conference in Venezuela, the first time it's held in Latin America, and I was really surprised when these organizations began to talk about national development. It really blew my mind because I was I was limited in my view of seeing distance education and structural technology uh, only in a small classroom environment. Didn't understand the implications until now of uh, using distance education to develop a country. And it, what, when, when you see this, you begin to see how small our vision was seeing um, uh, distance education so only within four walls and not be able to see it uh, really in, as, as, as a national project. Uh, from there, in, in 1992, uh, I go to the International Council of Distance Education's uh, World Conference in Thailand. And it was interesting because I was introduced to the first time, for the first time, to this concept of the industrial model of distance education. And by the industrial model, um, they were talking about how we should have division of labor as a different way of organizing distance education. And, and just to understand what this means uh, is that we're used to having this uh, a, an educational process where a teacher is constantly being asked to put on new hats, um, the, the, not only as a subject expert, but also as an instructional designer, as a technology expert, as an, as, as an expert in, in assessment, as an expert in communications. And so what we begin to see is that there's a different way of organizing ourselves as educators where we can have a division of labor. And, and this concept means that you have different experts and, and, and the persons with different expertise get together as a team to educate. And that's a whole different, that was a whole different concept for me. And, 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 it, and it broke my schemas in terms of how to educate. Um, and where are we now? Basically, I think we haven't moved that much in many instances. We still have dominantly a, an individualized craft mentality. We still have that teacher, that professor within four walls or, or with, with only one group at a time. Um, dealing by himself, basically, or with few people in his educational process. And, but at the same time, even though it's, it's, it's individualized in the sense of you have a person, an educator, working basically alone, at the same time, he's dealing with mass education in the sense that we, we, he's, he's projected or, he, or she's projecting a mass curriculum um, that really doesn't individualize because it's almost impossible to individualize one person with say 20, 25, or 30 students. And, and the contradiction here is that on the other side, in terms of society, we're seeing a greater digitalization 
of, of the economy of society and we're seeing a more personalized production where you can actually personalize the car that you want to buy you can personalize the sneakers that you want to buy but you can't personalize the education that you want to participate in as a student and, and to illustrate this um, imagine a, a, uh, a doctor going into his or her office and having all the, his pa or her patients stand up and say, hey, I'm going to give you two aspirins and I want you to come tomorrow. The patients will, will, will not tolerate this. They, they want an individualized treatment. And, but even though we may see this as ridiculous for a doctor to do, this is what educators do constantly when they walk into the classroom and they give the same content to everyone and then expect them to return for the next session. So there's a contradiction in terms of what people expect in, me in the medical field, but it's not contradictory to many to see this happening in the educational context. What, what this implies is that there, there's an, there has to be a new way for us to educate. And if anything is pointing the way towards a, towards a more individualized education, it's artificial intelligence. We have to bridge how we practice now education with what is expected in terms of, of the technologies that we have, especially with the introduction now of artificial Take, uh, of artificial intelligence. And I had a conversation with uh, Chat GPT uh, concerning this. And um, I asked Chat GPT, what's the current state of distance education? And what I, the response was is that this is distance education is gaining more and more acceptance. Why? Be well, one was the global pandemic. Uh, curiously enough, we as educators uh, weren't able to convince enough teachers and administrators to promote more distance education. Who did this was the great global pandemic. And we have now, because of that great pandemic, we have more technology and more access to technology so that we can now uh, advance our distance education. And another factor that uh, ChatGPT pointed out was that student demographics are changing also. Students are no longer studying full time uh, in, in our institutions. There's more part time students or teachers who share their studies with their work and their families. So uh, this is, is, is creating a demand for more flexibility. And in terms of the challenges that ChatGPT presented was one is that we have to ensure greater equality and access because we're not seeing that equality and that access equally distributed. And it, it, it also pointed out that there are concerns sir, uh, concerning quality and rigor that has to be addressed. And there are issues still in terms of accreditation that have to be addressed. And naturally, all this implies is new forms of training and support so that distance education can really be conducted well and effective. Um, so what must be done for this to, to, to take place? I continue my conversations with ChatGPT and uh, ChatGPT points out in terms of the future of education that I ask about. Um, G chat gpt points out that people are asking for more personalized learning experience the personalization of education has to be at the forefront and because we have the technologies we can have more virtual and augmented reality experiences with with the students so it can be more practical and it can be more uh, personalized for them to be able to understand the different concepts and skills that we want to develop. Naturally, we have the technology now for a more collaborative learning, so we can really learn together and not against each other. Naturally, with the way uh, the way that 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 uh, our the work and society is advancing, we need to have lifelong learning well implemented. 
and and this is where the future of distance education is going because we really have to have people who are already working who have families continuing their learning for the rest of their lives and naturally all this implies greater flexibility and this is where distance education must focus itself in in terms of being more flexible so that pe more people can participate remember when when i mentioned the different um milestones technological milestones that we were seeing uh in terms of, of of education and how we we found educational uses for them well there's a new milestone that's out there and that milestone is artificial intelligence but we need leadership and able to to carry out a a really good educational practice with artificial intelligence and and i'm hoping that heads can fulfill can can fill that void because we do need leadership to understand how we can incorporate artificial intelligence in the educational process so if we have this dream in distance education of being more flexible uh, of really really being uh, useful in terms of lifelong learning and and if we really want that dream to take to take shape we have to look at this history and we have to continually modify the way we we operate so that this dream can come true and definitely we can't ig ignore uh, artificial intelligence we have to be at the forefront to explain it and exploit it for the benefit of the educational process uh, that we participate in this means this means that we have to abandon that uh, grocery store concept of of of, uh, of teacher support and and, um, and 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 teacher training. Um, the, the the grocery store concept is just lining up offers and having the uh, the professors or the teachers pick whatever they want. That, that's not going to work because many teachers, many professors are just going to pick what their preferences are without necessarily going towards the dream of being, or they, they, they need organization, as Lenin pointed out. They need leadership to be able to reach the dream. And that means changing our mindset. We have to be much more strategic in terms of how we can really harness artificial intelligence for the benefit of distance education and to be able to do this with that leadership again i'm proposing uh heads can 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 really uh be one of the leaders in this field because we as educators have to see this and we have to debate how to better implement um artificial intel intelligence not just uh, argue against it we have to argue for it but how to do it responsibly that's the role that we have to play and i imagine we're going to be debating this out and so um, i'm i'm willing to debate this out because i think it's an important issue that we have to understand for the betterment of uh, distance education so let's begin the debate